Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar, WHS Challenges and Opportunities. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania and also the coordinator of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar. Before we do get started though, I'd appreciate you taking a few moments to read the following slide uh, which gives you information about um, the sessions that we deliver during WorkSafe Month. I'd now like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in this afternoon's event. So we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. You're likely listening in using your computer's default uh, speaker system. However, if you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity as well to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during uh, this afternoon's presentation. We will collect uh, all questions and address them during the presentation as well as at the end. We're also recording this afternoon's webinar um, as we are doing with all of the webinars that we do run during WorkSafe Month. Um, so we will progressively get those presentations up onto the WorkSafe site at the end of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. And lastly, uh, when you do leave today's webinar, a short survey will pop up on your uh, screen. So we do ask that you um, do complete that survey, provide us with your feedback and comments about your webinar experience and uh, also about this afternoon's presentation. I would now like to introduce to you from IPM Safety, Gary Lebsent, um, who will present this afternoon's uh, webinar, WHS Challenges and Opportunities. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Steph, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a little bit about my background. So I have a, an engineering degree is my original qualification, and um, I have over 30 years of experience in, as, as an engineer in, and being a supervisor and a manager in, in an industrial environment. Uh, some of the time it's been with BHP, some with blue scape steel, sometimes in um, uh, projects in coal mines and, and other industries. And uh, recently I've moved to Tasmania and currently working with IPM Safety. I've certainly provided um, quite a number of uh, training sessions in uh, work health and safety over time, but um, this is the first time I've actually been standing in a room with nobody else in the room, so it's it's quite a new um, activity or a challenge for me, not really knowing how well people are understanding what I'm saying. So, as uh, Steph said, uh, please feel free to write in some questions or comments and um, um, and in interact with me as we go this afternoon. Steph's actually not even in the room either; she's in another room because of some te technical challenges we've had. But uh, but let's kick off. So. So work health and safety challenges and opportunities, I guess it's a, a title that probably applies to, to all your uh, industries. The, uh, see we've got 30 people logged in so far. Um, so the topics I'm covering this afternoon, one's the, the essential requirements for work health and safety, um, then establishing officer due diligence, so this is officer of the legal terminology under Tasmanian uh, legislation. Uh, then the the ongoing challenge of compliance versus risk management, how how uh, companies are actually uh, dealing with work health and safety issues, work health and safety documentation. Um, um, many companies have many many uh, different sets of documentation, and it's a, a challenge to have it solid and, and well managed. And then uh, lastly, by but no means least, the um, uh, measurement of, of key performance indicators. 
and some uh, comments about what I've seen, how, how key performance indicators have been used by different companies. Just a question to Steph about how to move my screen. Oh, there's the first screen. Very good. So the um, essential parts of work health and safety for a, a solid system to be um, working uh, at each company. So the um, generally we learn from others' mistakes, I guess, and certainly Piper Alpha. Not sure how many of you have, have heard Piper, of the Piper Alpha disaster. Um, but it, uh, Piper Alpha was a an oil rig on the in the North Sea, just off England, off Scotland somewhere. Uh, it was built in uh, and uh, brought into operation in 1976, and um, operated uh, quite satisfactorily until about 1988. And I'm having fun with my my presentation here. Oh, there we go. So the started operation in 1976, but in 1988, a, a major disaster happened, which you can tell by the screen, um, with um, 167 uh, men died as a result of this awful disaster. Now, the um, there were, a, as you could well imagine, there was a a um, an in, a thorough investigation into the incident, and this is where um, summarised that equipment, systems, and people are the three main elements that make up an essential work health and safety system. So the essential requirements of a work health and safety system. So, uh, so Brian Appleton. The, uh, the the technical advisor to the, the the Cullen inquiry into the disaster. So this was this was his statement um, that um, it is the sum of our contributions to safety management that determines whether people we work with live or die. And and once again, uh, the many the many many pages of recommendations that came out of it are summarised into um, equipment. Uh, systems and people. So equipment-wise, uh, the workplace infrastructure, facilities, plant, gear, tools and so on, all the hardware that's used to do the work must be in a safe condition. So initially the, des the design's got to be right. You know, has it been selected properly uh, to, fit the, to fit the purpose that the operations generally or or even do we have the right chair the right desk um, installed in our in our office it doesn't have to be a a major industrial operation for this requirement to be uh, needed it needs to operate correctly are there um, operating instructions of, um, of the of the equipment set up ready to go and then maintenance. So, is the equipment maintained correctly, um, so that when operations need to alter it or alter what they want to do with it, it's the equipment is is ready and, and in the required uh, setup. So that's the equipment. Now systems. So systems must be risk based, but they um, and and an example is the risk register or a hazard register and a health and safety uh, a management system are the, uh, the classical uh, systems that are, are required um, to support the use of equipment. An example is you know, standard, standard procedures, training systems, so that people actually know how to use the equipment. So in order to perform the work safely, the workplace must have appropriate systems to prevent workers and others from injury and ill health as a result of the work. This means that the workplace must have effective management systems such as policies, procedures, training, supervision, instructions, maintenance and risk management systems. 
For example, plant isolation systems, confined space entry systems, emergency response and evacuation systems, and to have them as, as far as reasonably practicable installed. And the, and the challenge is how to uh, document these, how to get new people um, into the industry uh, trained and and use and using both the systems and the equipment so that leads into people so people it's the it's critical to meeting duty of care and preventing injury and ill health in the workplace that the culture of the workplace enables the people to behave in a safe and healthy manner while at work People must also be competent to manage the risks in the workplace. They must have the appropriate training, skills and coaching. However, people can make mistakes and therefore we must build a culture where people support each other to be healthy and safe. This means we need to coach people on why and how to interrupt each other. And so culture um, is, is generally set up by the leadership um, that um, managers, supervisors demonstrate in each of your, of your work sites. You can probably sit and, and think at the moment of how, what is your culture in your work site at the moment and how the leaders, the supervisors or the managers, superintendents, whatever their title is, how they lead the particular culture in, in your area and how uh, culture um, then um, helps the people, is the backbone of people uh, supporting systems and equipment and um, ultimately allowing people to go home safe and well at the end of each day. So, so that's, and certainly the right person in the right job and I'm sure that little phrase will have many of you thinking about um, uh, those in your team, those in other teams you work with and, um, and that's a challenge in itself and, and this is where the systems come in, the selection process, the coaching process, the training process um, that uh, supports, selects, uh, aims to get the right people in the right job. And that's not only the, the workers, it's also the supervisors and the, the managers are the right people in the right job in that location. So essential requirements, um, so, so I've mentioned equipment, systems and, and people. Continuous improvement and planning is also a, an essential requirement. Uh, generally there's there's no workplaces where work health and safety is absolutely uh, perfect and uh, continuous improvement and planning is, is an essential requirement to reducing the overall risk, meeting duty of care, allowing people to go home uh, with a better chance of being safe at the end of, of every day. And continuous improvement is also helps with um, uh, consultation and involving people in improving their, their work site. Honest assessment and reporting of risks and incidents. So an honest assessment, how well the supervisors in your area actually support honest assessment by people. Um, the supervisors then report issues up the chain, so to speak. It's, it's all a, an essential requirement to enable a work site to, um, to work safely or even to improve, you've got to have the, work, the, the assessment being honest in the first place and the reporting. And we, we get to talk about, uh, I'll talk about uh, documentation a little later on, but the reporting of risks and, and incidents has been my experience that um, sometimes that system can be quite convoluted, complex, slows people down, and they're not inclined to use it. So another challenge is to find a method of uh, um, enabling, supporting people to, to report risks and incidents without them feeling it's such a big chore. 
and the, an important part of it is so that when they do report risks and incidents, there's actually some feedback comes back to them to, that demonstrates um, the, the benefits of their reporting risks and incidents and they can actually see something happening uh, and improvements. The last one here, constant alertness to complacency developing. So um, for those people with uh, industries or work sites where there's very few, in, uh, very few injuries, certainly complacency um, is likely to come along and um, uh, bosses, people stop worrying and um, that's one of the things that um, as soon as complacently it comes, it means that the, the time between now and the next injury is getting shorter and shorter. It's um, certainly one thing I've learned is we need people uh, constantly alert, um, helping each other. Certainly as uh, an earlier slide, oh, I think I mentioned earlier, um, we're all humans and we now and again will make a mistake depending on how, how uh, good a sleep we had the previous night whether we had a, an argument with our partner, the dog was barking next door, well, whatever the issue was, there's, there's things that stop us or challenge us, challenge us to think clearly uh, now and again and um, good teamwork, constant alertness to complacency uh, developing is a, one of the essential requirements of a, of a safe work site. So we've got a, a polling question for you now. Um, which, which of these essentials does your work site cover? Uh, we'll just take a, a few minutes and um, yep, Stephanie's controlling it now. Here's the, here's the quick poll. If you could just fill that out and um, we'll see what sort of answers we get. And also again, if you've got any questions, because that was, that was the section on the essential parts of work health and safety, being equipment, systems and people. Alright, so we've got a high percentage, 82% for equipment and people and 89% of uh, people think they've got good systems in place. So um, uh, generally systems are a little bit easier to put in place but um, uh, thank you for that feedback and um, we'll continue on with the, the next slide. So the next section is um, establishing officer due diligence. So the, um, the word officer uh, comes from work health and safety legislation um, and I'll get into what, what due diligence is in the, in the coming slides. So this is the, I guess, the structure of uh, Tasmanian work health and safety legislation. It's also the structure for most states across Australia, I think it's just Victoria and uh, Western Australia, they don't have exactly the same system as us here in Tasmania, um, but it's effectively the same. So you've got the Act, you've got health and safety regulations and then codes of practice. So within uh, the legislation are where the requirements for officer duties come in. And if I get quiet now and again, it's only because I'm trying to get the slides to work. And I'm wondering, oh, here we go. So the key provisions of the Act, um, so they're the, they're the main uh, provisions of the 2011 Act uh, in Tasmania, as I mentioned. Um, 
but the top three, so duties of care, uh, duties of persons conducting a business or undertaking, PCBU, so that's the, the legal term for, I guess, the employer, um, whether it's the, the board or, the, or perhaps a, a person that owns a business, and this is where the term officer comes in. And it also, the Act also talks about duties of workers and others, and it also talks about consultation duties. And the, the summary of these duties, so, so we've got the, the primary duty of care there in the, um, that the, the employer has. So this is the operation of the business. So they have a, you know, a, a duty of care for the whole of the operation, um, reducing risks to a reasonably practicable level. But the officers, which is what I want to focus on in this section this afternoon, so, this, so the officers' duty of care, so they're, they're uh, making decisions, decision making and governance across the, the organisation. And um, I'll come back to the details of that soon, but just, just let me cover the, the PCBU because the, the officers actually um, support uh, the owner's duty of care, so the PCBU or the owner, um, so they've got the control of the workplace as I mentioned. Um, they have a duty to provide consultation with the workers and um, giving authorizations, empowering other people to, to make decisions because the, the owners can't be everywhere, obviously. Incident notification to, to WorkSafe Tasmania and then upstream duties is where um, an owner of a, a building that someone else leases, as an example, or, or their company designs equipment, so they actually have upstream it's called upstream duties of care. Now, in, so officer due diligence. So the Work Health and Safety Act identifies the, responsible, the responsibilities of officers as those intended to align with the definition of officer under the Corporations Act 2001. And from this definition, we can conclu conclude that a director, a company secretary, a chief financial officer and senior managers that make decisions and, th and have the authority to make decisions that impact all or substantial parts of the business are deemed as officers. So these, so these are people who've got significant control over budgets. They've got significant control over uh, resources, uh, number of people um, and, and, and elements like that. Now, the, I guess I'd describe it, um, the, the Act actually have, um, pre prescribes that officers have specific duties and some of the, and these at a high level are, are on your screen at the moment. And I in essence, it's not, it's not good enough for, for officers to, to sit back and say, uh, you know, if there was an injury and uh, work safe or um, someone was investigating, they say, well, sorry, I, did, I didn't understand anything about that hazard. Well, these, the, the Act actually says that's not good enough and they've got to have systems and procedures in place so that they can um, understand what's going on in the workplace where they are. So, so they have a duty to have an understanding of the nature of the operations of the business and hazards and risks associated with these operations. In practical terms, this means officers will need to be engaged in a program of training and information monitoring. This could include regular officer board briefings to make them aware of legislation changes and new case law, for example. Safety performance reporting with sufficient detail to identify trends and emerging issues that require intervention will be essential. So they've got to, so this is perhaps your industry's or in you have a number of audit programs going. Well, that's um, partly to, to support officers' um, requirements under legislation. So officers must focus on major hazards. This will require a major hazard or a risk plan and must include high consequence, low frequency hazards. Um, not, not every industry has high consequence, low frequency hazards. You, may, you uh, might remember I spoke about the Piper Alpha 
oil rig, so they had operated for 12 years without a major incident. And then when they had it, boy, it was there a high consequence. So that's, what's, that's an example of high consequence, low frequency uh, type hazards. And they, they can be um, quite a challenge to identify, understand, and um, keep control of. So hazards associated with core business activities must be identified and specific legal obligations complied with. So the officers must also ensure appropriate resources and processes to enable identification, elimination or control of specific hazards and risks, compliance with specific obligations, for example, consultation and incident notification. So across the different um, industries that um, your listeners are from, you will have, uh, I'm sure you'll have a range of different um, legal uh, requirements, specific obligations. It really depends on your industry as um, like some mines have to report on uh, lead monitoring, for example. Um, officers need to ensure resources are available to identify and manage hazards um, proportional to the size and nature of the operations that are being used and this will include personnel at an appropriate level, investment in plant and equipment, investment in systems and processes and investment in people, competency and culture. And you can see so the, the, there's that link between equipment, systems and people again. So this is where officers have a legal requirement to ensure all these are, are, are satisfactorily in place. Officers also have to have a, a, an up-to-date knowledge of work health and safety laws and compliance requirements and ensure legal compliance is being achieved. This will only be achievable by the PCBU undertaking legal compliance audits. Practically this means that all PCBUs or the owners or the employer will need to indicate specific hazard audits, whether it's noise, construction site management, plant substances, falls, confined spaces. There's lots of lots of different audit topics, and and I'm sure some of you are in in industries that seems to be never ending these audits going on, and I guess um, the numbers of audits perhaps as a as a reflection on how um, urgent, how important your offices actually um, see their duties, their legal duties and, and how they um, and what they're putting in place to actually meet um, their legal requirements. Now I'm talking a lot about from a legal point of view and um, officers uh, also have a, uh, I guess I'd, I'd suggest um, a, a duty of care, it's sort of a, a moral obligation to want their, their people to go home safe and well each day. Uh, the government just tries to help this process by putting in all these rules and um, um, making it, um, um, I guess, putting various legal requirements and different penalties um, in place uh, to try to help officers be reminded of, of what, what they what their duties are. I can still remember the general manager of the the steelworks that I worked in uh, saying to a, um, a a quarterly briefing. He said, "Hey, you guys, I don't want to go to jail, and I want you to do this stuff, this work health and safety stuff." And uh, he he just got the message of of what could happen to him if uh, people weren't um, uh, hadn't put in systems and procedures and and following rules, etc. So, officer due diligence. So, I guess just a cartoon to um, is a, a a chemical focused one, but um, I guess supervisors, uh, officers have different ways of of getting their um, requirements across. This one was just a, a connection to um, a chemistry. Um, once again, you can reflect on the on the different supervisors and managers that you've uh, dealt with in your careers and 
um, supervisors and managers will, as we're all different, they'll have different methods of getting their requirements across. And um, we mentioned later on this afternoon, I'll talk about uh, KPIs and um, one of the methods of, of uh, officers actually monitoring what's happening in the workplace is, is monitoring key performance indicators, KPIs, and, um, and rewarding people, um, coaching them, uh, performance managing people, um, hopefully appropriately, um, so that um, I guess safety standards are maintained in the workplace. So that's the, that's the section on officer due diligence. Now we've talked about systems, when I was talking about uh, equipment, systems and people. We've mentioned systems again under officer due diligence because they have a, a legal responsibility to have uh, systems in place and so that leads into compliance versus risk management. And um, I guess this is a, a significant challenge for many industries because compliance is a lot easier in the short term. Um, how many of you have seen, uh, perhaps uh, taking an example, um, someone turns up on a work site to do some work and they ask him, ask him or her, have you done your JSA? Uh, yep, boss, here it is and they're good. Off and go, off you go. So that's sort of an example of compliance. You know, they've 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 complied with the request to produce the JSA or the SWIMS or the JRA or the JHA, whatever it might be called in your work site. Um, the the real challenge is the is to use that as an effective risk management tool, so that um, so that actually uh, it's based on the current risk and danger, and it's actually got uh, the workers buy in, you know, via consultation, uh, via other methods to, uh, to ensure practical and um, essential uh, controls are in place um, in, that um, are reflective of, of, the, of the risk and danger of the work that's going to be carried out. And um, so the quote here from a, a chief uh, officer of a, a chief executive officer of a company, uh, compliance to accreditation does not mean risk management. And even though uh, compliance to accreditation can mean a tick, a, a healthy score, even a pat on the back from a successful passing of um, an, of the current order that's going on, it does not necessarily mean that risk is being managed to as low as a, a reasonably uh, practicable. Uh, some of you probably um, remember the, the Blue Horizon uh, incident in the Gulf of Mexico in, I've lost track of how many years ago, but I understand they were celebrating um, uh, um, a largish period of time without lost time injuries and then suddenly it literally blew up in their face and, and they had a, a number of fatalities. and. Um, and um, so hence, that's a, a little example of compliance to accreditation does not, does not mean risk management. So some more information about uh, compliance. So yeah, documents for documents sake. So um, I guess that was, the, that was the example I gave you with, with JSEAs and, and um, so documents for documents sake, sometimes they feel that um, you know, 10 pages is better than one page and um, you almost tell how good it is by the weight of it. Um, certainly a, com a compliance based system as opposed to really just having the, the essential information that's in the, uh, that's needed to be in the document to, um, to help the workers and the supervisors know exactly what controls need to be in place from one activity to the next. Um, some other examples about um, compliance, so global rules versus departmental rules. It's quite easy to make a global rule like, you know, everyone in the whole company has to wear safety hats. 
as opposed to, well, it's just the people in the areas that where the risk of something falling from above um, is are the only people that need to wear the wear the safety hats, or even surf life saving having national rules that that um, may not apply to uh, colder waters in Tasmania versus uh, northern waters in uh, North Queensland where there's potentially a different set of hazards. And um, uh, I would imagine even in your work sites you could probably think of or reflect on some broad rules that have come in um, that, that uh, perhaps don't even become more of a hindrance perhaps in some areas of the plant. And, and risk management is around thinking through that and um, working through to uh, what's uh, considered to be, um, you know, really, really needed in, in each area that's proportional to the, the hazard in that particular area. Another aspect, um, some procedures can be around for, for quite a while, so um, the same rules the rules that we had in 1980 don't necessarily apply in 2015. Technology has moved on um, and uh, one of the challenges with um, um, documentation rules systems is that um, they need uh, um, regular reviews, um, you know, double checking that they're, that they're still relevant. I've quite often heard over time where you hear a an incident happened and they've and the automatic response seems to be to to add a document or or add another paragraph uh, to as a as a corrective action. Um, so once again, it's sort of it's compliance. It's yep, we've had the we've had the uh, incident. We uh, need to do something. We'll add another document so that we'll uh, and we'll train our people so they won't do that. Well, I won't make that error again. That's not quite. That's not the essential aspects of risk management. Um, thick documents. I think I mentioned that earlier. That um, um, thick documents that sort of um, put people to sleep is um, more of a, a reflection of a compliance uh, culture rather than a, than a risk management uh, system. So well managed risk. I mean, it requires knowing the risk, you know, understanding the uh, the, the consequence, the positive, you know, the credible consequence and the and the the likelihood of that uh, consequence happening. Uh, having a plan to manage the risk, um, having clear and simple and effective systems. Sometimes we can um, certainly make systems complicated. Um, like some of our incident reporting systems, where we we know we want to get to the root cause, so we we ask all these we want have all these questions that we have people to fill out on uh, fill out in the incident in the report form, and they're just um, and they're not necessarily trained in it, and they need to go out and do their work, and um, so it becomes a problem for them. Accessible and easy to use systems is part of. Um, risk management so that if people need to get information they can readily access it and once again use it whether it's by computer screens or hard copies um, there's no uh, one rule fits everybody it's a case of whatever suits depends what the environment is maybe it's too dusty or dirty or grimy for for a computer system to work so um, it's a matter of working through that Certainly, so well-managed system, so regular scheduled audits, inspections and interactions. Um, certainly it was one of the um, main lessons I saw that um, in, when I was in, in industry in the, in the steelworks in New South Wales, when, um, when this, uh, we, we got a consultant in to help uh, uh, train us how we need to improve our safety systems and one of the things was was regular audits, regular inspections, interactions with the bosses, getting them out of their offices and down on the shop floor to actually see what's going on, give the people opportunity to talk to them so that um, so that when discussions about spending the next million dollars on um, whatever the next bit of equipment is or the next uh, safety 
uh, reduction program, they've got a better idea. They've actually seen the issues and actually talked to the people who actually work with it. So well-managed risk, risk management, so having recording systems for data collection, analysis and planning. Um, yeah. Data collection, analysis, certainly important parts of making informed decisions. Strong communication and consultation. So, yep, certainly part of risk management, getting people's, the workers' views and on, on hazards, control measures, uh, other controls they may have seen when they worked with other companies and making, making, the, the, uh, making benefit of uh, people's wide range of experiences. Uh, also under a well-managed risk is sort of a clear and positive leadership which then leads to a, um, a positive attitude, a want-to culture, uh, an improvement-focused culture, and then the um, uh, development of middle management, which really depends on how big your, how big your company is as to, um, I guess, how many levels of management you have. So th that's so compliance versus risk management. So um, I guess in summary, that's the... Um, I guess the challenge of just having documents for documents sake or being able to pass the, pass the audit versus actually you know, doing risk management, having rules into actually uh, that are practical, that are effective, um, that, that actually uh, um, are actually helpful in reducing the risk and allowing people to go home and um, safely at the, end of it, at the end of each and every day. So compliance, I was talking about documents, so that leads into document management. So um, once again, uh, I'm sure you've got lots of experiences with um, documentation in your systems uh, at your work site. So um, certainly the work sites I've been at where they've had, um, I guess, a, a long period of safety professionals, um, people trying to do the right thing, a culture of having a procedure for everything that's done, well, you end up with lots and lots of documents. So you've got some challenges, accessibility, how do people access documents? Um, it's quite easy today to have it inside a computer system, but then does everybody have access to a computer? Um, versus the other where I've seen some work sites have, they have um, a large number of hazardous chemicals on site and they've got all their SDSs all lined up in, in all these folders. And um, um, so the question is, you know, how, yes, it's accessible, but then how easy is it for people to find what they're after and, and uh, find something in plain English, what, what they've got to do or what they've got to do to, um, in that case, uh, handle their chemicals safely. A workload. So I guess there's a couple of workloads here. There's the workload of actually managing the documentation. I mentioned uh, rules in 1980 are probably not going to be all uh, relevant for 2015. So there's a workload involved in um, maintaining documents and keeping them up to date. Um, Tasmanian legislation changed 2012, 2013, so there was a workload for, for people to, for companies to review their documents to, to see whether they were um, still meeting their legal obligations. There's the workload for actually training people when new people come in to the business, um, making sure that they um, understand the documents what it means to them in their particular role, um, the workload of, of just wording the documents in plain English, wording the documents so that um, whether it's a manager or a frontline worker, that either role can actually um, get from each document what they need to understand and do. Relevance. So um, instead of, um, you know, some documents I've seen have lots of sort of legal waffle in there or motherhood statements, I guess, are the comments, are the, are some comments I've heard. So, it's, so this is linked with the workload. 
um, how to how to get feedback from the uh, from the workers um, so that the documents are actually relevant and they'll and they'll use them and they'll they'll feel that they can make um, suggestions to improve the documents up to date. So I've mentioned that challenge with relevance and and the workload. And then in some circumstances, the uh, contractor chains and you end up with uh, multiple copies, multiple copies of documents. And, and I guess this is um, not just in contractor chain, but sometimes, you know, people print out documents and they, I'd rather have a hard copy on their desk ready to look at. Um, and then the, then the document gets updated and you've got different versions and so you end up with multiple copies. So another challenge of, of documentation management. Accuracy. So here's the challenge of, of um, be careful to what the, what the wording is in the documents versus what's actually being done. Um, because they, um, if there's an audit comes along or if there's a, an injury, heaven forbid, and an investigation starts and, and finds that you know, people aren't following the document because the, the document was outdated or whatever reason, um, yeah, then there's uh, a source of trouble there, and hence a source of workload, a source to uh, a requirement to, to keep documents up to date. Um, there's a legis legislation driven, so there's a requirement to, to keep documents uh, managed, so depending on uh, whether it's storing, uh, storing the different documents, um, there's certainly, uh, depending on the, the risks of the industry, there's different requirements driven by legislation for document management. And sometimes they can be seen as a solution to everything. Um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, in an earlier slide, uh, an injury happens, how often is it that there's a, another procedure or, or another paragraph gets written um, with the aim of, of solving that, that problem. So, another poll. Um, how well are documents managed at your work site? So, over to Steph to organise the poll. Yeah, so how well are documents managed at your work site? What do you think? Do you think it's poor, acceptable or excellent? Okay, so I'll close the poll in a couple of seconds. I'll close the poll and uh, share responses. Okay. All right, so a bit more of a uh, distribution of, of results um, compared to our first poll. So 71% uh, is acceptable, 13% is poor, and 17% is excellent. So we've got a range of industries, I'd say, from the, the people listening to this uh, broadcast. So um, uh, I guess those with the... The, uh, the rating of poor, I guess it'll be, be interesting how you can influence your, um, perhaps your safety committee, your safety rep as to, as to what you think is poor about your documentation. So back to the slides. Sometimes I take a little while for the computer to, to behave itself, speaking of having equipment that's, that's ready to go all the time. Oh, here we go. Yep, thank you, Steph. So, um, yeah, just another cartoon, uh, trying to get the message across about the benefits of procedures, I guess. And uh, by the look of it, there's a few pages in that procedure, uh, whereas it could have just had a you know, needed a guard around the uh, the saw so he didn't cut himself. And yet another one. So uh, sometimes, yeah, documentation can be. Uh, is not is not that easy to get at, and and then where do you where do you find it in the multitude of pages? Uh, some of it people just need to be trained in it, so they don't have to rely on going to the procedure to actually uh, follow it. In this case, in the, in an emergency. 
Alrighty. So documentation. So so many benefits in in keeping records, and I probably don't have to go through each of these with you. Uh, I'm sure you've probably heard all this before. And um, um, but the challenge, the challenge is it's sort of what I went through. You know the workload, the relevance, keeping it up to date. Um, um, but these are the these are the benefits. Um, sort of uh, certainly picking one, you know, standard work procedures, documenting the, the best practice that people have learnt over time that um, is both safe and efficient and uh, um, simple for people to use. Alright, so documentation, so just leading on into uh, key performance indicators. So. So key performance indicators are um, typically used by uh, management. Uh, I think I've mentioned that in the early stage, certainly by officers, to, to see how um, how uh, the safety performance is going in their in their business or in their department. Um, now trends. Trends are the key pieces of information to get from KPIs. It's not the specific number, but it's actually the trend. Is the trend getting worse? Is it getting better? Um, what do we need to focus our efforts on, our know, improvement efforts on in the next, uh, the next couple of months? Um, so on the screen now, we're sort of, uh, th so these are lagging indicators. So there's um, two types of indicators broadly. So there's lagging and leading. So the lagging ones, um, very easy to measure. So the, these are typically, you know, t after the injuries happen, how many injuries or the, perhaps the injury severity rate and um, once again I'm guessing that most of your uh, companies have some sort of um, indicators in this um, mode that are being monitored and you may even be getting uh, rewards or a barbecue or some sort of celebration um, when some typically lost time injury frequency rates have been, some records have been broken. So some, some leading indicators, so leading by the, um, almost by what the word leading means, so this is leading up to the injury before the injury happens, so for example the number of hazard reports, um, so uh, keeping an eye on, so I mentioned uh, managers um, using KPIs but also health and safety committees um, can use uh, key performance indicators of the trends, so I can check well how many hazard reports are being filled out uh, on a monthly basis, is the trend getting worse, sorry, when I, is the trend increasing or is it, or is it um, dropping off, are people getting sick of filling out hazard reports, um, or is it getting, were there more hazards, actually is the workplace getting worse because of some changes and more hazard reports are coming in, so it's, um, uh, the trend is important but then the next level is to actually go and look what what's it really mean, what's the message behind the trend. So number of incident reports, same sort of, same sort of deal. The ratio of hazard reports to incident reports, um, lots of workplaces I see, um, there's a requirement to uh, report injuries, so incident reports, injury reports, whereas um, it's not cut, clear cut as to when a hazard report needs to come in, so, um, so there's a theoretical ratio of something like 7 to 1 of hazard reports to incident reports and, and if you're getting the ratio the other way around, um, 7 incident reports to 1 hazard report, there's, there's, uh, the trend says that there's not enough people reporting hazards for whatever reason. Maybe they don't know what a hazard looks like, maybe they think the report will get ignored, but that's part of what um, health and safety reps, what health and safety committees, what their role is um, to, to understand, to uh, give management some, uh, some guidance as to why uh, the trends are happening. Percentage of workplace inspections completed on time, so another uh, lag indicator. Numbers of corrective actions overdue, so you have people filling out incident reports and, and each incident report by definition normally has uh, one or more corrective actions to be done, so you can track well how many of the corrective actions are actually done on time, 
So once again, check the trend. Are the corrective actions being ignored, or the or is the or is the system for monitoring this, the management of it, is that is that not working too well? So various things are when you ask why, why is the trend going up or down, is where you start to learn uh, or start to get the benefit of using key performance indicators. Percentage of staff have completed mandatory training. Another KPI that can be uh, uh, followed to with good effect. Okay, so another another polling question: Do you have key safety indicators or key performance indicators displayed and, and used at your work site? So just a simple one here: yes, yes or no, um, just to give us an indicator of what your how things are going at your work site. And I'll close the poll off in a couple of seconds. Okay, so I'll, I'll close the poll, Gary, and show the results. All right, so it's almost a 50-50 split. So, so some people are not seeing 43% of our 30-ish um, uh, registered people are um, are not seeing uh, key safety indicators displayed at your work site. So, um, once again, you could ask some questions, supervisors perhaps, and um, um, yeah, aim, aim at improving the place. Thanks, Steph. Um, we're close to running out of time. Do, any questions have come in, Steph? Not, not at this stage, Gary. <laughs> I'll let you um, continue with the with the uh, the webinar. No, that that's okay. I've actually, I think, when my slide scrolling button works again. Oh yeah, here we go. So advantages of using KPI. So so gives feedback on progress. So you can um, implement um, some actions at work, and um, it gives some feedback uh, before having to worry about whether there's more or less injuries. Um, certainly, the the leading indicators gives you almost free feedback if you like on progress. So you can look at trends, enables targets to be set. Um, as you probably know, management loves to set targets, and um, so you can uh, classical target, you know, reduce injuries by uh, 10 or 20 percent in the current year, and these are the activities we'll do to to meet that target. Allows selections of areas to improve. Um, if the uh, you know the the percent of people not meeting the training requirements, if if that's not a very low, if that's a low percent, then um, uh, it allows management committees to recommend which areas need improving in the next six to 12 months. Some traps in using KPIs. So lag indicators are after the effect. So you, you try to do something to improve, well, it actually takes uh, time. And also people are suffering um, from um, in a system that uses just lag indicators. Suppression of reporting. So uh, you know, sometimes when there's rewards and celebrations, um, when some KPIs are being met, people start um, uh, not reporting correctly, and uh, so that's a, a trap and something that needs uh, careful attention. Uh, keep an eye on, and once again, health and safety reps, health and safety committees who have people there who know what are going on, um, can speak up and, and and mention such things to management. And then a trap that there's a focus on the stats rather than the activities, and certainly the activities, the controls, the the keeping people um, health and um, safe uh, every day is is the important thing. It's not just what the what the trend says of the KPI. Alrighty, I asked Steph about questions, and um, we've sort of somehow managed to. Uh, to take up the full hour, so um, so I guess this is where I say thank you very much. And if you have further questions, um, feel free to contact me via our website at ipmsafety.com.au. And uh, thank you, and 
back to Steph and work safe Tasmania. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Gary. We've we've got a couple of minutes before we do close off the webinar. So if there are any questions that um, that anyone would like to ask, uh, please do. Um, while that's happening, I'll just run through. WorkSafe Month does run up until the 30th of October, so please do have a look at the um, program of events, which is on the WorkSafe Tasmania website. Do you go there, have a look at the uh, the calendar, what else is happening in the webinar space. We've also got uh, more live feed sessions happening next week at the University of Tasmania, so do have a look at, uh, at what... Um, what sessions are on. We've also got our venue sessions uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks uh, too. So do do have a look at what um, what else we've got running. The HSR conference in Launceston happens uh, next week too. Uh, question that has come in, Gary, uh, how do you form a work health and safety committee? How do you form one? Um... Usually with, one answer is usually with uh, management leadership um, and it's, um, so it depends whether you want to form it, uh, um, well I guess the, the essence of it is getting people, one person, one representative from each area and group of people on your work site and, um, get, and certainly have a um, a manager, a senior manager in the group as well, so um, so that when there's a discussion happening, you know, senior management can you've you've convinced them what's happening, but but it's getting a number of people together that represent the workplace um, and then meet on a regular basis. Okay, thank in, in you. In essence, of how to get the committee together. All right, thank you, Gary. Another question that's come in is, um, it's not clear in my company or organisation as to who an officer is. Yes, um, certainly um, some some organisations do find it um, a little bit of a challenge as to who the who the officer is. Uh, as I sort of mentioned, um, they are typically senior managers or owners who have the authority set to set uh, budgets and allocate resources. Um, I, I guess my uh, my advice is uh, to seek some help, you know, from external groups such as perhaps IPM Safety or WorkSafe Tasmania um, can come in and, and 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 offer advice if they're really stuck. But certainly senior managers. Okay, and probably just a final question, um, Gary, is have there been any prosecutions in Tasmania under the new uh, 2012 Work Health and Safety laws? So. Um, my my source of information is actually the work uh, WorkSafe Workplace Issues magazine has had details of of uh, such prosecutions and um, uh, maybe Steph, if you know a little bit more about that, I've seen your face on the on the cover of that magazine on occasions. Um, I I do have I do have uh, one here about. Um, um, I think Hobart likes to pick on Launceston. So Launceston City Council was fined $10,000 after a worker received a serious cut to her chin from, from broken equipment. Uh, it was actually in the Launceston uh, Aquatic Centre. And um, so, yeah, that happened in September 2014. So that was an example of where they were convicted and fined for $10,000. And certainly more information in the... Workplace Issues magazine, December 2014. All right, thank you, Gary. And that's probably where we'll end it. But um, just on, on that uh, point that Gary made about uh, the Workplace Issues magazine, it is a free quarterly magazine that uh, WorkSafe Tasmania puts out. So if you aren't a current uh, subscriber and you would like your free copy, if you do head to the WorkSafe site, and uh, register your details and uh, you'll receive the, the next issue which comes out in December. So on that note, thank you very much, Gary, for your presentation this afternoon, WHS Challenges and Opportunities. Thank you as well to everyone who participated in this afternoon's uh, webinar and um, uh, please do have a good rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>